So I called my topic for the day, what if God was married? Um, we're having another sort of non-history day, you might say. And so, so what I've done for the term, if you look at the syllabus again, is I've taken the grand scheme of time that partly follows history in some absolute sense and partly fo follows the Bible scheme of time from you know, before there even was an Israel through the first establishment of Israel through kings and so on. But there are various topics that are fun to talk about, interesting to think about, that have to do with, that, that are related to history, but that have to do with aspects of life that may play across different historical periods and where the evidence is incomplete. And certainly some of these religious issues relate. And so today is going to end up revolving around one piece of evidence. And again, this is what I've tried to do for most classes, but we're going to start this piece of evidence pretty much at the beginning, and we're going to spend a lot of time looking at it, and I'm going to see what you think of it. And then at the end, you're going to tell me if it's possible that God was married. <laughs> and uh, you can, I won't make you vote or anything, but you could end up in different places. But in order to get us to the point where we're ready to look at this piece of evidence, I wanted just to kind of frame it, I guess, with, with a question. So, so we've, we've talked a little bit about, about monotheism. And you could say that biblical religion is defined around monotheism. And I don't want to take a lot of time with this. I want to, I want to push this a little farther, but just help me again. So, so what's monotheism? So how, how do you define monotheism precisely? What are the categories? Somebody? Like what do you... What's mono, right? Okay, but go ahead. Okay, so the worship of one God. So you've got one God, you've got worship. What do you want to, you want to add something? Yeah? So that's actually, which is, so you say the belief in one God, so that's interesting. I mean, the one everybody's going to believe, agree on the one God part. But uh, it's interesting, right, that worship versus belief. How might you say belief is different from worship? Um, well, I guess if you, you can believe in one God and not believe that others exist, or you can worship one God and still recognize the existence of others. Okay, so all right, that would be it. So if you go with that, right, then there's this question of whether you're talking about existence or, um, or worship. And by your category of belief, you'd be, that's an interesting way, using a good modern word for it, to wipe out the existence too, in, in a way. So that's sort of more narrow technically. Um, so here's a, a question that we maybe haven't talked about quite so much. And this is, where are the cracks potential cracks in the Bible's monotheism. So, so one, you just would have said, right? So if you say, well, it's, it's not necessarily about existence. It might be about worship. Well, so can you think of, in the world of ancient Israel, in the world of the Bible, where there might be sort of flaws in potential if somebody were to come along to somebody in the Bible's world and say, you're not a real monotheist, I'm like, what? Yes, I am. <laughs> and they say, no, because what would they point to? Can you think of what they would, like what could be a place where the whole monotheism thing might be iffy? Yeah. How they recognize the other people's Okay, so, so if you recognize the existence of other people's gods, that would be the thing that's brought up, then, then that would be one. You could say, well, if, you really, if you're a real monotheist, you shouldn't even believe they exist. Um, you should get on that one. Um, but where, so that we've got out there. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if you, right? So, so the, another way to go at it, this is a good thing to put on the table, is that there's one question of what the ideal might be, 
and you can say, whose ideal is it? And the other question is what people actually do. So from one point of view, you could look at the Bible's own story and say, well, they clearly don't act like monotheists because they're always out there worshiping other gods. First thing they do, they turn around. You got another idea? Yeah. God says, let's create them in our image. Yeah, let us, yeah. Okay, good. There's an, that's just the sort of thing I'm after. If you're going to go and find that monotheist and say, you're not a real monotheist. What's this us business, right? So, I mean, and how's that different from the idols? Yeah, or at least others, somebody's. Yeah. Well, or at least in the case where they're called idols and, and the people are condemned, it's certainly, it's, it would be considered outside of what was proper, outside of what was allowed. Whereas when God says, let us create humans in our image, then it seems to be authorized. It seems to be part of the system. And then the question would be, who would those, who, who is, who are we? Um, and of course, you can tell it's an uncomfortable topic because one of the solutions has been to say, well, it's kind of a royal we. Of course, there can't be more than one. It's, it's just a way of the king speaking. Although that doesn't really get you off the hook because what is the royal we? It is the king embodying his whole population. That's exactly what the royal we is. Do you know what I'm saying, right? That when the king says, we have decided, he, he is saying, I, as representative of all of my court, of all of my population, of course, I'm the one making the decision, but that's, that's good enough, right? Um, because I represent everyone so perfectly. So that would be what God would be saying if that's the case, yeah? Um, I think we talked about it before, but there's a passage in Psalms, I think David quoted, where he says, God was the ruler of the universe, and that's what he was doing. Yeah. And then he says, Yeah, that's right. So this is Psalm 82, and it has this reference to God sort of standing in judgment of the gods and it even outright acknowledges that there are these gods now at the end of the psalm they get demoted um, so in a weird way it's a picture that both acknowledge that the existence of gods but says they aren't they no longer have any power or something which is an intriguing combination that for us might seem a little too uh, for them it's pretty aggressive <laughs> and yet for us might seem like it's uh not decisive enough on the existence of other gods. So, so we, we got a couple of good categories here, right? There's sort of other gods in terms of, of worship, them actually worshiping them, um, meaning illegally in the Bible's point of view, from the Bible's point of view. Um, there's the possibility of acknowledging other gods as part of the court of God somehow, or that, that when God creates that he's not alone, that he's representing or at the head of some body that we don't know. Um, there are a couple of other sort of weird angles. Like what, there's a guy named Brian Schmidt from the University of Michigan who looked at the laws against um, making images of God. So it's a sort of famous commandment, you shall make no other well, how's it go? I don't have the whole thing in front of me, right? But, but you, you can't make a, any image of me in the heavens above or on the earth below or you know, flying across the skies. And he said, well, you know, this is interesting. Um, what if they had mixed forms, which they did, like sphinxes, right? That, that had, you know, flying wings and, or cherubim, like things like that, right? They, they had lion's faces and flying wings and, or, or human face and lion's paws. And uh, we have actual images of all these creatures. And so he wanted to say, well, this is OK. You, know, you could have beings like this. And so you might ask that in terms of the monotheism question. Like if you have these sort of monster type beings that might be immortal, they might live with God in the heavens, but are they gods? And then there's another category, which is people who are dead. And we haven't really talked about death yet. But what happens to people when you die, when you live in this ancient world? And the simple answer is that 
you go down under the ground and you know you lead a very boring sort of dusty life um, you don't go to be with God in heaven heaven is for gods and Enoch and Elijah <laughs> those are the only two biblical characters who go to heaven and it's almost like they're deified that they get to go to live with God um, so, but the funny thing is that those who are dead in the ancient world more broadly surrounding Israel are usually put in the category of deity. And a lot of scholars have figured, well, there's some hints in the Bible that you can see this concept there too. So another monotheism problem might be dead people, spirits of the dead. Um, and that you could say, well, I mean, you're not supposed to worship them. But what if you're supposed to give them nice things to make them happy so they don't come and bother you? Well, you know, so um, this is all to kind of set up today, which is that there's another potential problem <laughs> with, at least now, not the Bible's monotheism, but Israel's monotheism. And that is going to be the possibility that God had a wife. And that in some circles in Israel, it would be possible to imagine that God could be married, but that that didn't threaten worship of Yahweh alone, because it was just his family. Now, the evidence we're going to look at today doesn't necessarily lead you to exactly one conclusion on this matter, but you'll see, and if you read, you know, for today, the article by Hadley, you would have seen that when you see something about Yahweh and his Asherah, and you know that Asherah is the name of a goddess, then it makes you start to wonder, <laughs> like your mother when you're dating or something. You may not have come out and said so, but it looks like there's somebody else in the picture. So this is the question of the day, you know, that whether for some people in ancient Israel, people whose voice never got directly into the Bible, there could be somebody in God's life, you might say, a female. And what would the implications be? Would that be, and whoever wrote these texts must be just polytheist, like they are against the world of the Bible. Or is there something else going on? And so, again, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I'll ask you to consider certain issues, things that we see in detail from the material in this evidence. But there are a lot of questions, and in fact, coming in on the train today, I was reading a dissertation on, on stones. Um, the Hebrew word is matzeva. They're, they're uncarved stones that could be used to mark a divine presence. And I, I saw that they could be in wood. And this suddenly made me wonder about Asherim. So we'll come back to that. All right, my goal for the class is actually not to answer the question of whether God is married in anybody's eyes, but it's this. To grapple with the implications of non-biblical evidence for ancient Israel when it does not easily fit Biblical expectations. Okay? To grapple with the implications of non biblical evidence for ancient Israel when it does not easily fit biblical expectations. Because that's what we've got today. One of the fun things about archaeology is that they find stuff, new stuff, right? So with the Bible, you're just looking at the same book over and over and over again which is still very interesting and leaves lots of room for discussion. But the thing about archaeology is that they're coming up with new evidence, and sometimes it kind of works with the Bible, and sometimes it's just independent, and you think, what does that mean? Um, and sometimes it looks like it doesn't quite work with the Bible. And this is one of those times <laughs> with this stuff we're going to look at today. So the question is, what do we do with it? And so let's see. Um, so the 
I guess I, I, I won't yet go to the, the, the visuals, but, but let me read to you. This was in Hadley. I hope you had a chance to look at her, uh, her article. Um, there were three inscriptions. I don't know if, if you had a chance to look at it, that, that amidst all of the commentary, there were three short texts that she mentioned that were on these. Did you get what a pithos was? What's a pithos? Did you even get that far? Uh, so these things were found, drawings and writing on pithoi, two big jars. It's a Greek word for it, great big jars. And of the writing, the two clearest examples are these. One says this. Uh, oh, and, and just to give you, this is the name of the place we're talking about, Kuntilit Ajrud. Um, do you have Hadley? Uh, well, hold, hold off, right? Yeah, I know you have it. But then once the screen comes down, and I'm not ready to have the, that other light yet. Um, so it's K-U-N-T-I-L-L-E-T, Kuntilet. It's just the, the, the name of a modern site in the middle of the southern desert of modern Israel. And then Ajrud is A-J-R-U-D, Kuntilet Ajrud. They did this excavation. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the site in a, in a little bit. They found these jars, drawings, writing. And here's what the text said. I bless you by Yahweh of Samaria, sounds good, and by his Asherah, that's harder. And the second one says, I bless you by Yahweh of Teman, T-E-M-A-N, I bless you by Yahweh of Teman and by his Asherah. May he bless you and keep you and be with my Lord. Okay, so here we've got, it's pretty short, right? But what issues come up? Basic words. Like, what, what can you do with this? Yeah, go ahead. Well, his ashram. Yeah. Is, you, you don't usually say, I mean, this sounds like ashram belongs to him. Okay. So it sounds like ashram belongs to him. Could a wife belong to a husband? Yeah. But so, so, I mean, you're totally right to hit on this. Um, any other reaction to that part? Or, and we can come back to it. For one, I guess I would say that when you say, well, that's a good question. When I hear that, I think that the noun that follows the pronoun, right? So the his should be a category. Like, like it would be weird to say his and then have a personal name that's just one person. Like you could say so-and-so is his wife, but you wouldn't say, in my case, his Nancy, my wife's name. Right? It just sound, that doesn't sound right now, and I bet it didn't really sound right then either. So then, then the question is, what does that say about the Asherah if you put his in front? Um, go ahead. Le, le, different level in which direction? Nancy, yeah, right. Well, I mean, if it is a proper name to say, then it could, could seem more affectionate. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Um, go ahead. Um, also, the Ashra has the ability to bless. Okay. So that, by Ashra and by. Yeah, but. Yeah. Okay, so this is another piece. So, so we've got the his, j just in terms of factual information, stuff to grapple with. We've got the his plus Asherah. And then you've got the blessing, because if you think there's, what, what is this Asherah doing? And it's involved with the blessing. Notice that it's, it's as a pair, though, right? So whatever the blessing is, it's together. Any reactions to that? Like, what, what is that? What do you, how does that strike you, that they bless together? Yeah, go ahead. No, actually. So, so Asherah is, this is the funny thing, if I go with my wife, invoke my wife's name. 
So if I said his Nancy, which is my wife's name, um, it would be like that because Asherah is a name. It's a personal name of a goddess. And I'll explain at some point who that goddess is. I'll, I'll wait just a minute. Um, I might as well do it now. So it, part of how we know about the, what you call pantheon, the, the set of gods for the, the world of ancient Israel, not just Israel itself, comes especially from this site called Ugarit that we've mentioned a couple times. It's, it's older, so it goes back to about the 13th century BCE. It's on the coast of northern Syria. Um, but it has both rituals and lists of gods and then stories that, that describe gods and what they do. And it turns out that the chief god in charge of the gods at, at Ugarit was named El, or Ilu, which, is this, which means God in Hebrew. It's exactly the same, uh, the same name. And that's interesting. Um, his wife is Asherah, is named Asherah. The name, it, and it's a personal name, it doesn't mean woman or, or goddess or something like that. There'd be a different name for that. So, so, but then the weird thing is, the question is whether once we say his Nancy, you know, of, but, but could that become generic in some way? You know, that, that it's a personal name, but it's become attached to something that's a type or, right? So that, that becomes a question. But blessing, back to the blessing, right? So, so what do you, like why would, if you, it's fine, you say, may be blessed by this God, Yahweh. So what do you get by adding and his Asherah, no matter what it is? Yeah. Right, so I mean, one, one way to do it would be to take it as a, a wife, and then what would that mean for the blessing? Right, so like, why add the other character? Any ideas? Yeah, go ahead. Well, it could take it out of the monotheistic context, but aside from that, like at least if it's another, per another person, another divine person, then there's two of them involved in one action. Yeah? Well, so now you're getting a blessing from this like, team rather yeah. than just one person. So it could be greater in a sense. Um, yeah, OK. Because now two people agree. Or, or, yeah, I, mean, so, so, I don't know if you all heard that, right? But that if it's, if it's a team, if it comes from two, Although, again, it's two who decide together. It's a sort of household, right? It's like both your parents actually getting together, which, depending on your parents, may be harder to imagine than easier. But yeah, go ahead. That's an interesting idea, right? The notion that marriage itself would be a blessing, and then out of it comes a blessing or something. But now, so. so Remember, though, that we're not still totally sure what an Asherah is. It is still kind of strange that it's his Asherah, and it could be still that you have another deity involved. Is there anything else that an Asherah could be? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if, if, you, if you saw this in some of the reading, or which would be great if you did, um, <laughs> or if you just knew that. Um, but if you do, then yeah, it's associated with a wooden pole. So, so in the Bible, when you run across the name Asherah, like nine times out of 10 or 19 times out of 20 or something, there's a couple times that might, might refer to the goddess, but almost every time it's some kind of wooden object. And like at least in one case, they burn it. And we, we know for sure it's wood. And it seems to be kind of like a tree-shaped thing, yeah? Yeah, the kings are t condemned for not taking them down, along with altars that belong to other gods, and these stones, in fact, that I was just mentioning a minute ago. So yeah, they're, they're on the list generally of, as a type. You don't use them. You know, you're not supposed to use them. But the thing to keep in mind is they are objects, and they're in the category, again, of altars and these sort of stones on, that, that were associated with worship of other gods in the minds of certain writers in the Bible. But the reason that's important is that it's not like they're actual represent, like an altar. I don't know. I mean, it's not a representation of a god per se. Um, 
So to complicate things, when you say Yahweh and his Asherah, if you went straight with a biblical usage, which this is not the Bible, as you can tell by the Yahweh and his Asherah part, um, it wouldn't exactly be the God and his wife. It would be the God and his wooden object. But then what would that mean? So let, let's just say... Okay, I'll tell, tell you, right? I mean, that the Asherah is a, an object, a wooden object that is associated with worship of other gods. Um, so now we have Yahweh has one, which the Bible never says <laughs> that Yahweh has one. And Yahweh and his Asherah object together are going to bless you. So this is the way, so it's not actually to say that the whole team concept and all that is still on the table. <laughs> But I, I wanted you to see that there's another direction, too, that you could go. So, so I know I'm asking you to think on your feet, although you're all sitting. Um, <laughs> maybe it's a little hard when you're sitting. But uh, so I, I'm telling you, right, that so now you have this situation where we go back to the blessing question. If, if Yahweh has an object, why even mention it? Well, how does that help with a blessing? Got any ideas? Okay. Well, Asherah is known for representing the power of another god, or other gods, like the worship of other gods. Okay. Maybe he's blessing as himself in, in, in grouping with or in work of the other gods as well. Okay. So, so you could have the Asherah representing the power of other gods. I'm just repeating to make sure everybody hears. Um, the power of other gods... And that the blessing would then be both Yahweh's and some other gods. Now, what other gods might that be? You can tell I am leading you into a trap. <laughs> what other gods? What's the obvious other god? Asherah. So if that's the case, why not just say, here's the trap. Why not just say, maybe blessed by Yahweh and Asherah. What's the difference? Because I totally agree. This is, a, this is a very sensible direction to go. Like, why have this object that's called Asherah? It's like an Asherah, but that isn't actually... Like, why not just use the name of the goddess then? So what, what's going on? Okay, you don't know. <laughs> Well, I don't totally know either, right? But what I want you to see, at least, is that where we are then with this language, just at the heart of what we've got here, is we've got Yahweh as part of a team. He's associated with what seems to be treated as an object because it has his in front of it. And yet that object is really closely associated with a goddess, and a very particular goddess at that, of great power. Um, so that it seems like it's Yahweh and Asherah, that together they're blessing with their power. And yet then there's this question, like what, why then isn't it just saying Asherah? But I'm going to put this in a couple little different directions. So, so I'll go back to my first question. Like what other information do you have here? So we have the blessing, we have the his Asherah, we have the complicated discussion of what an Asherah is. Do you, you want me to read them again? All right, so here they are. And I want you to tell me there is a little more information in here. I bless you by Yahweh of Samaria and by his Asherah. That was number one. I bless you by Yahweh of Teman and by his Asherah. May he bless you and keep you and be with my Lord. Okay, yeah. Could they be referring to two different Yahwehs? Yeah, did you catch that right? So could they be referring to two different Yahwehs? Why do you think so or wonder so? So what, yeah. Okay, right. So, so for one, I mean, this is one more piece of information to get, which is that there appear, never mind the Yahwehs, the two different Yahwehs, they, there appear to be two different Asherahs in a sense, right? So when it says his Asherah and his Asherah. And, and the reason that I say that has to do with the two names of Yahweh. So why would you say that, Yahweh of Samaria and Yahweh? 
of Teman. Do you think they believed in two different gods? Go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, this is, all right, so he, you could say they're reiterating that he's the god of the people maybe in that place or something like that. Any other reaction to this? I mean, the, um, so, so here's the extra bit of information. Of course, this isn't familiar if you're not part of a polytheistic world. But in the ancient world, they, ought, they had lots of gods and they had lots of temples and shrines and holy places and divine figures. And they had this kind of complicated sense, that a little bit like what you're saying, that you have one god, but the individual people can worship that god in their own place, and the god can be the god of that place. But, of course, what that meant in practice was that they would have a different temple, or a different shrine, or a different image that was identified with that place. So that in Samaria, which was the capital of the kingdom of Israel, which was in the north once there were two, um, they would evidently have had a manifestation of Yahweh that they understood to be the, the, God, the, the version of Yahweh that you worshipped at Samaria. And there was very likely a temple or a shrine at Samaria that would have been identified as the shrine of Yahweh of Samaria. And then whatever there was at that temple to identify you know, the, the presence of Yahweh there would have been called or identified with at least Yahweh of Samaria. So of course the intriguing thing is Samaria is a city. Teman is another name for part of the region of Edom, which was uh, way down south. It, um, it would be kind of south of the Dead Sea, a little bit over into Arabia, uh, a little bit kind of overlapping with what's called the Negev in, in southern Israel today. And it's not a city. And so you could say, well, if you said Yahweh of Teman, would there have been a particular place where you worship this, this God? And maybe, in fact, we, we don't know. Um, but for them, it really, it, they would have figured it was one God, Yahweh, but it was two manifestations of that God. And when you said that God and his Asherah, you're talking about two different Asherahs because you're talking about the worship of Yahweh in two different places. Okay, so all this kind of goes into the, goes into the, the package. Now, um, if I back up a little bit, uh, with the papers due and everything, I don't know how many of you got to read the article, but um, there was a, a little bit more information in these texts beyond what I read, and, and it's because I skipped the opening of each. But the, the next question could be, what are the texts? Like, what are they? What are they for? Like, what are they used for? And, and this is how, how they went. Um, and I don't have it right in front of me, but don't, don't bother. I'll get close enough. Like, the first one says something. It's very broken, but it says, to so-and-so. Or, or it says, let's see, it says something like, thus so-and-so, it gives a name, broken, and then it says to this person and that person, like two or maybe even a third name, and then it says what I quoted you, I bless you by Yahweh of Samaria. So, so what it is, is it's, it gives the name of the person who's going to say this, and then it gives two other names, so who gets the blessing, that's nice, um, and then the statement makes the blessing. Make sure you get his Asherah in there. The second one says, uh, again, um, so-and-so, to my Lord. And then it says, I bless you by Yahweh of Timon and by his Asherah. May he bless you and keep you and be with my Lord. So then you can say, well, who's that, right? So those are the texts. They're written on these jars that also have drawings on them. And we'll see a little bit of the, that later. So what are they? What, what is this thing? Like, uh, 
Because remember, right, like, well, if you think of blessing, where would somebody use a blessing now? Yeah? Well, I think a wedding would... In a we- you mind a wedding? You know, I mean, I was just at a bris type, uh, but without the uh, actual circumcision, naming ceremony with a blessing, baptisms, um, but anything else? That it? Sort of think of things like that? But right. But what, what about these? All, this, all the examples you gave, where's the writing? It's not really clear, right? I mean, somebody might have a book of blessings or something that you read from. But for one, you expect that a blessing works when it's spoken and when you're there. So one of the weird things about this place, and now, now let, let's go ahead and look at the, uh, some of the pictures. This is just from the end of Hadley. Go ahead. Yeah. And they were talking about could be like a welcome sight. Like a welcome site. I don't remember what yeah. the language like the language like bless you and you as sort of like a going out on a traveling sort of or like a journey so, kind of. So how does that strike you if it's a if it's a welcome? Remember what I said exactly about the, the form of the blessing, right? It's to a very particular person. So for one, if it's a welcome, it's not generic. You know, welcome all who visit here or something like that. It's one specific person blessing another specific person or a couple of them. So if it's a welcome, which is possible, then it's a very specific welcome from one person to somebody else who's going to show up. Because otherwise, how are they going to read it? Yeah, so you could say from a priest, which is, so again, I mean, this is all good to put out there, but um, look at this top one, right? So, so this is at the end of Hadley's article, last page, I think. And so we're going to get to these pictures down there. Those end up being important, the other part of the evidence. But up here, th- this is the site. Like this, this is the whole thing, and it's in the desert. Right? So we are way down south in what's the ne- modern Negev of southern Israel. It's out in no, nowhere land, right? The, and, and back then it was nowhere land. It was then, and it is now. There are no towns around. There were no towns around. So out in the middle of nowhere, up on the little hill or whatever, I mean, there was reason to think maybe there was some occupation there. So they excavate this thing, and they find a little bit of a building over here, and then they find one big building. That's it, right? This is the town, except for it's not really a town. And it's got a kind of a big courtyard area, which is where it says Western Building, if you can read that. And then you enter over there, kind of between the buildings, where it says number one, and then it's got these kind of gate areas. And see, so again, you can't read very well, but where it says Pithos B and Pithos A with the line kind of up the top, that's in the kind of upper part of the gate chamber. That's where they found these things. So here they are, like hundreds of miles almost, from, certainly from Samaria, out in the middle of nowhere. And it says, I bless you, so-and-so, by name, in writing, by Yahweh and his Asherah. So if it was a welcome, it would have to be, oh, well, I arrived here first, and I know you're coming after, and so I'm going to write it on this jar, and you'll see it. Could be. But you can see how it's not a slam dunk. And if you imagine priests, you'd have to have some guy who doesn't mind living out in the middle of nowhere at this place like this. It's not a temple. That what? It's just there. 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 Yeah, to recite this or or like bless local travelers and have his hand out for a little money or or something. Um, Yeah. 
So, so here, we, here we are, right? We've got this, uh, you know, we've got this set of blessings written on jars. Like this is not exactly a formal document. And it's at some kind of place. It might be called a way station sometimes. It appears to have been near a, traveler, a traveler's road. Um, but that's partly figuring somebody had to have come by here because it's certainly not a town. And you find this information. Um, I'm going to come back to the, the location thing. But meanwhile, we've got drawings. Now, the thing you have to remember about study of ancient Israel is that, number one, in the Bible, we don't have anything about Yahweh and his Asherah. And we don't have anything about Yahweh and Asherah. And you'd figure pretty much that anybody who worshipped Yahweh was not supposed to get anywhere near Asherah. So that makes this really interesting right off. But the other thing about the Bible, if you remember, is that it's got this thing against images. Like you do not make pictures of Yahweh. And something about the very nature of Yahweh should make it inappropriate to have pictures. Like that, There are parts of the Bible that that talk as if the very notion that you could portray God in any form would undermine his character as God. So when archaeologists get out there and they find images, figurines, pictures, and they do, um, the first question that's on everybody's mind is, is this a picture of Yahweh? Like, could somebody have drawn a picture of Yahweh? And you might think that when you look at these pictures in this lower left-hand panel, that there's no good candidate to be a picture of Yahweh. But if you read the article, <laughs> you would see that people have absolutely suggested it. And then the question is, what do you do with it? So I just wanted to introduce you to the argument. So what do you got here? Well, I mean, this is kind of partly broken away. But here you have a cow and its calf, which is a sort of classic picture of nurture, where you have the cow kind of looking after its calf. And then you have these two obviously noble characters in the middle. Um, and then a kind of another sort of funny looking character up here who's sitting on a chair and playing an instrument, which would usually be called a lyre, some kind of lyre. So it's a stringed in an instrument, like a little harp, in a way. So any idea about whether these are, let's try to decide where to start, <laughs> human looking? What do you think? No? Not human? What are they then? OK, yeah. They're, they look decidedly male. Now, now <laughs> just to focus on that potentially male uh, protrusion, <laughs> what else could it be, they be? A tail. It is actually possible that they could be <laughs> tails, especially if we're not talking human. <laughs> no, but you can see why the question would, would arise, right? So, all right, so you've got these two creatures that may have tails or may not, <laughs> as the case may be. Um, so do they look human at all? No. What are they? That, somebody? They look like cattle. So that's a, that's a possibility, although... What might make, if they were cattle, what would be funny about them? We're being really basic here. They're standing up, right? OK. <laughs> no, but look, if you're going to be an interpreter of ancient art, you've got to deal with these things. Every, everything. Are you, so when you're choosing the kind of animal to say that they might look like, because like if I covered this up and I said, OK, do they look like cattle now? Then probably the answer would be, no, you're judging by the head, I think, right? So, so what other animal could they be? 
And, and don't worry, this is not a trick question with a simple right answer, because the, the art specialists aren't really sure either. Any idea? A dog? A dog? That's not a bad idea. Something else? A? Yeah, that's interesting. Actually, the, the, the people haven't generally said monkeys, because I don't know if the faces make people think of a monkey, especially if, if this is the kind of long nose. This is a way of drawing the long nose. Um, which maybe, but but I, I like the idea of a monkey in a way because it's at least standing up. Um, yeah, you had an idea. Well, maybe it is a person because they're wearing masks. Yeah, that's an an interesting idea. Go ahead. Yeah. Going along with the uh, cow aspect. Okay. Their feet kind of look hooved. Okay, way. especially the right one, maybe a little the the middle. Yeah. They don't look too flat. In the right. Mouth. So. Okay, so you could imagine that they're hoofed feet. I, li I like the mask idea, by the way, or at least just to complicate things and realize that you never know. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Long nose stuff in the middle is like a horse, too. Yeah, I suppose you could think of a, a horse. Um, people have wondered about lion type things, just by, to throw one other thing into the. And they've also thought about leopards, and the reason is because they're spotted. But of course, then part of the problem is that this character is spotted and the face doesn't look much like anything. Um, yeah, go ahead. Don't we also have to deal with the issue that like, they weren't using like, advanced you know, writing tools or, okay. or like, loose leaf paper? So it's, the precision is not going to be as great as like, we can. OK. Although the, the thing to notice, this is a really good line of thought. In fact, let's hold that just for a second. Just the one other comment and then. Okay, right. So, I mean, this is something to put out there that when I say, are they human us, it's not totally cut and dried. And, and even in the mask thing, that's an interesting thing to put in connection with the possibility of seeing deities that have a sort of animal aspect, but maybe also a human aspect. But let's come back to this issue of technique, you might say. So, for one, I mean, this is hard when you look at ancient art because. Even art specialists can sometimes get on their high horses and say, well, this is really a fine example of such and such. And you think, are you sure? Like, what's your criteria? What are your criteria for knowing that? Um, but let's do it, right? So, OK, take a vote. Is this fine art? Anyone want to say yes? Yes. I just feel like the cow and the calf are very well drawn. OK, that's an, OK. Like All right. It's not just, I mean, their lines are a little bit smaller um, than okay. are with the figures, but they're, it's very clear what they are. So it yeah. doesn't appear that the artist had difficulty in drawing what they were trying to draw. And okay, but really actually, I, where I thought you were going to go with this, so what is that? Well, so here's the question, right? Is this the same artist as that is? Yeah, so I mean, that's actually maybe not, right? So that, that's a good observation, and immediately you might. And then what does that tell you? Because then you've got this other, now this is also the, uh, it's the same pithos over here on the right, right, with the stylized tree and the, lion, the pretty good lion. That looks like it could have maybe been drawn by the same person who did the cow or somebody with better tools or skills or something, right? But it doesn't look like the same artist, if you want to call it that, who <laughs> drew the figures. Um, so what does that mean that you seem to have, what does it tell you about the nature of the art, that it doesn't look like the same artist. Yeah. Well, that one must have been an addition to the other. Okay. So All right, so probably not at the same time. Any other rea reaction? Um, yeah. Different time periods. But I mean, it, for one at least, go, go ahead. If it's, a, if it's a god, they don't know how to draw it, which is an interesting idea, although you know, they had, there are plenty of other places where they would draw very nice pictures of gods. With, it's not, it, it, I like the idea of saying, noticing that the animals are a lot better drawn than these other figures and wondering whether that's the religious angle is a component. Now, of course, we don't, if you say gods, like, we don't know what any of these things are, right? They, somebody could just let be doodling almost. But the thing that I want you to, well, like think of the category of graffiti, for instance, right? 
you find these jars and they've got these little bits of writing on them and they've got these drawings on them. But the big question has been whether the drawings go with the writing. And if the drawings and the writing were meant to go together and you have, you know, I bless you by Yahweh and his Asherah, then the question would be whether, you know, out of these figures, especially out of these two, because they look like they are, they do look like a pair, don't you think? Right? So, so however badly drawn they may be, um, and, and however much that's the technology and the material, or just the skill, like the, these are not fine artists. That's what I was going to push you toward, right? Is it, for one, it, this isn't high art somehow, and, and they're just, just not really skilled people, especially not, maybe not those. Um, but they do look like a pair, do you think? So if you have a pair of figures in the blessing and you at least have a pair of something in the drawings, then you can see why scholars who are wondering if there's ever going to be a picture of Yahweh anywhere would say, well, Yahweh and his Asherah. Uh, the big one would be Yahweh, maybe, and the little one would be Asherah, yeah? And maybe that actually accounts for why it's not like a, why we can't make out what animal or what it is, because if it is a picture of Yahweh, we don't know what he really does. Yeah, what he looks like. right, so I mean, this is to say, if we don't know how they would draw Yahweh anyway, and then, and then of course, the same guy who I said talked about mixed forms not necessarily being illegal, it was in connection with an article on this, and he wanted to say, look, you know, they're sort of mixed forms. These aren't illegal according to the commandment against making images. Why couldn't it be that? Now, um, this is not to advocate that position, but uh, it at least is to show you why people have wondered. Now, whoever was noticing that they might be, well, I mean, between the various observations, that they might not be drawn at the same time, think about the drawings and the writing that the writing and the drawing is not necessarily at the same time. So you could have the following choices. The writing and the drawings could be unrelated. Like just write off if you wanted to say, I want to draw a picture that honors the worship of the God Yahweh. Would this be the picture you would draw? And you could say, well, yeah, if I was pretty, you know, not very good artist. and <laughs> maybe, maybe it would be. Um, and yet, one of the things about these mixed forms is that they tend to be protective deities, like they would be the guardians. That's why cherubim are like this, right? That they're, they're the guardians of the throne of God. Uh, sphinxes have this type of role. They're guardian figures. There are other Mesopotamian examples of guardians. Uh, they don't tend to be the leading god. And so far as Yahweh is the god of Israel, and Yahweh of Samaria is certainly the god of Israel, then you wouldn't expect to portray Yahweh by a mixed form, sort of a mixed animal form. It just isn't the, what those forms are for, never mind anything else. So aside from that, though, remember that if, if the art itself looks like it's from multiple hands, the drawings could be from different hands from the writing. They could just be unrelated, yeah? Well, when you say legitimacy, of course, it's uh, already sort of responding to this question. But I mean, it, le legitimacy is only when we come along and we say, maybe this is Yahweh. Um, I mean, they, they're there for some reason. I mean, you could say it's a kid doodling, but then you'd have to say, well, what's the context for a kid doodling? Is it at some way, desert way station out in the middle of nowhere? writing on an object that also has blessings that are, you know, that have names and I mean it's possible but it's more likely an adult doodling than a kid doodling if you if you had to pick somebody doodling. And then the question is, you know, it's still a fair amount of trouble. Like this is not a place where like you could say in the ancient world maybe a scribe would doodle, although we don't have really good evidence for doodling. Um, but it's an idea. But then you'd have to be in a place where you knew there were scribes and workshop or something like that. And it's not really that either, right? It's, but, but that's where I think the category of graffiti might be not bad, because we know that people go to places and they doodle, and they say, so-and-so is here, in effect. And then the question is, what do they draw? 
or what do they, what do they write? And um, then that's a good question because they don't seem to, with the writing, they didn't just write their names. They wrote a message to somebody else. Um, but it's a good, that's right. So, but of course, all, with all of this, then you could say, well, how do you know it's religious, for instance, even? Like, how do you know it's a picture of, you know, something divine at all, whatever it is? And that's where even the, I mean, the, these things, like the, the enthroned lyre player and the, the cow and the calf, those are images that had at least kind of religious associations, even if they didn't indicate a deity. And so it's pretty likely that this kind of mixed animal form, whatever it is, might have religious associations. For one, in this kind of protective deity category. But uh, as I said, it's not the way you'd expect it to be Yahweh anyway. But you're, you're right. I mean, if it was an official like plaque, this is the protective god. I mean, they would set up statues in front of Mesopotamian te temples with these mixed form animals. And they were there. But what good does it do to write a little picture on a pot? Uh, good question, right? So, um, writing an, an image, right? If, if one possibility is that they're just unrelated. Another possibility is that they aren't from the same time. Because somebody had said that about the images, right? You could have somebody have written that they could go together, but not from the same brain, right? That you could have somebody write the blessing and somebody come along doodling and going, okay, you know, here's Yahweh, here's his Asherah, and it's somebody else, which would still be information about somebody making the connection. Or you could have the other way around. You could have somebody do the drawing, and it's whoever it is, and then somebody writes the blessing and says, oh, yeah, that's these, these characters here, I will have them do a blessing. Um, but, it, of course, to make those things work, you'd have to be able to say that these types of images could go with that type of blessing. All right, so this is, uh, in terms of marking where we are, right? That I, I want you to linger over this. These, this. these things were only found in maybe, I don't know, the 70s, something like that, 1970s. Um, pretty big deal because, I mean, j just to have mention of Yahweh and another figure of some kind, anything, would really not have had any comparison anywhere. May you be blessed by Yahweh and anything, right? Like, that's just not normal. And then to have it be an Asherah or Asherah is even more provoc provocative. And then to have it turn out to be on this jar that also has drawings. Some people got, they, they couldn't resist, right? At least making the connection. In the end, I, I think that, I, I just have a lot of trouble imagining that the drawings connect with the, the, with the, the writing. Um, they, they just don't even look like they're setting themselves up to be sort of major deity. And then whatever his thing is, I mean, like if it was two deities, why not just say blessed by Yahweh and Asherah and, and not go with this his Asherah thing, which in the Bible at least is an object. So we, if we had that, we should have a, you know, a figure for Yahweh and some kind of recognizable object. So I don't think they probably go together. But that brings us back to the, to the, the words, right? That, that even though he has this really interesting complex of stuff, you've got these words. Now the question is, what do you do with it? Um, and part of this goes, well, to the location. So, so we, you know what it says now, right? It says, may... I bless you by Yahweh and his Asherah. We talked about the other little details. But now think about where we are. And if we want to make a sweeping statement about Israelite religion, right, so we're talking about ancient Israel as a whole, what does this tell you about what Israelites believed or did? What does it tell you? or not tell you, like th think about, just be careful, right? So what does it tell you? Israelites believed that Yahweh should be worshiped with an Asherah. Does it tell you that? 
Are you not sure you want to take a risk? Yeah? So, I mean, in terms of, so, so for one, again, as I told you, this is the first reference to such a thing found anywhere, which is why it's such a big deal. But of course, you could keep in mind that it's just that one place. So, if you think, all right, this is the only reference to an Asherah associated with worship of Yahweh. Actually, there is one other from uh, another, another site that's a little bit later, um, but it's also similarly kind of on this sort of southern, eastern inland fringe. Um, it was found close to the time this was found, but that's it. What does this tell you? Do Israelites believe that Yahweh should be worshipped with an Asherah? Yeah? Is it necessarily fair to say that this is speaking for all Israelites, though? I mean, couldn't it be like a small sect of their religion that believes this? Okay, so, so the, if the question is then, then uh, could it be a sect? Does it have to speak for all Israelites? That's, exa that's partly how I'm pushing you, right? So, so we've got one place. Now, what can you tell about these people? Can you tell that they're even from Israel? How, how would you know that they're from Israel? Now, do you remember where I said it was, where they actually found this? It's way down in the south, right? It's, it's not even in Israel, properly speaking. In fact, it's not even in Judah. It's not in the kingdom of Judah or the kingdom of Israel. It's south of them. But how would you know it's in Israel? Or how, how, did you know, how would you know that the person who wrote it is from Israel? Yeah. You had your hand up. Yeah. They used the word Yahweh. They, well, they used the word Yahweh and, that's good, that they, well, I mean, but you could have some foreigner who worshipped Yahweh. And, but yeah? Yahweh of Samaria. Yahweh of Samaria. Right? So it uses the name of Yahweh that's identified with the capital of Israel, which sounds pretty authoritative in a sense. Right? So, but this is interesting, right? You've got somebody who's traveling, evidently, or at least who's got contact with the worship of Yahweh way, way up north, but who's, who's using the name down here. But uh, the thing to keep in mind in terms of location is that you, do, you have one place. It's not a temple. It's not a public monument. It's not uh, an official document that's composed by the king or you know, authorized by the government. It seems very much a kind of personal thing if you talk about doodling, right? I mean, one of the implications of that is that it's a private individual, right? What, however serious that person may have been. So it's, it's not a, a public statement, okay? So if you say, well, what does this mean for Israelite religion? I, I don't want you then to think, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It's just somebody, and they're way out in the middle of nowhere. The inscription is in Hebrew. It mentions Yahweh. It talks about Yahweh of Samaria, which is the God who would be identified with the capital of the whole kingdom of Israel. And just the fact that, like, would you say that it's less important because a regular person says it as opposed to an official? Like in a way, it could give you more of a sense of what regular people thought than official religion, what was authorized by the state or a temple or something. But realize that you've got what you've got. It's a fascinating piece of evidence, but it's out there on its own without a whole lot else to go by. So at least you should think that in your picture of, of, uh, of ancient Israel and its religion, that this is the sort of thing that was possible. That it was on the map of what people in Israel could believe or think. So I guess the, you know, if I go back to my, you know, my, opening question, you know, will you tell your friends that God was married? I, I had somebody come up to me, I don't know, a few, few weeks ago or a month, month, couple months ago and, and say, 
I heard this crazy, crazy thing that there's something from the, you know, archaeology that, that portrays God as having a wife. Are you kidding? I said, oh yeah, no, no, I know what you're talking about. This, right? <laughs> That's what they're talking about. So if you say, well, so is there evidence out there that God was portrayed as having a wife? Then I don't know what you're going to say, right? <coughs> sort of, right? Um, here's what we've got, right? We have somebody from the world of ancient Israel. The date of this text is probably about 800 BCE. So that's the time when the kingdom of Israel was still going. There were two kingdoms. That's the period we've been working in. Um, Yahweh is associated with an Asherah that belongs to him. And there seems to be one that goes with each of his places of worship. Right? If there's a Yahweh of Teman worship, he's got one. And if there's Yahweh of Samaria worship, he's got one. The sense is that, that in this mode, Yahweh should have an Asherah. And his blessing's more powerful if he uses it with him. And even though that Asherah may not be the goddess, you know, the two of them together, it's got her name, right? It's associated with the name. If you're to imagine that Yahweh is paired with Asherah because of the name of this object, one thing to keep in mind is, in the Bible, Yahweh and El, the word for God, are combined, right? I mean, that they are one deity. Like all the times that you would mention God with a capital G in the Bible, you're using the name for what could be treated as another god. As some, like you wouldn't just, in the ancient world, use the term God and uh, mean it just generically. It's, got, it, it's, a, it's a name. But for the Bible, they've taken the word God and they've attached it to the word Yahweh and said they're the one and the same. In Adugarit, the God whose name was God had a wife. And that wife was called Asherah. The pair is El, God, and Asherah. So when you have Yahweh and Asherah, if that's what you have, then that connection's already been made. You with me? That Yahweh and El, Yahweh and God are one already. So that's something to keep in mind. One other thing, though, that made me think, what, what if this whole thing is, is off on the wrong track? I was reading this dissertation on the way in about the, the worship of stones. And when you talk about these illegal objects, you know, the altars, the stones, and the Asherah poles that the Bible takes off after sometimes, then the interesting thing about this, this list is, is that if you look at the stones, and you go up to this, uh, like up in northern Turkey, Syria, the person writing this dissertation, this Swiss guy, uh, he said, well, the thing about these stones is that some of them are wood. It's like, huh, wooden stones, <laughs> you know. Then what's an Asherah pole that's made of wood? Right, so in effect, is an Asherah pole like a wooden stone? Right? It, it's the sort of object that's associated with, with, associated with a deity, but it's made of wood. So if that's the case, like in, up in Turkey, these wooden stones were not identified with any particular god or something like that. They're, they're an object. <coughs> so, so what if, when you said his Asherah, the idea is that Yahweh had his own kind of like figure that, represent, that was associated with himself, except for it was made of wood. And that's what you called an Asherah. So it's possible that instead of the whole wife thing, that you have Yahweh and his sort of wooden object that goes with worshiping him, and those are what are doing the blessing. Sort of Yahweh and his object that you worship him with. Not, not a goddess. So, there you have it. Is God married? Maybe, maybe not. You can stick with no if you like it.